Breaking tonight, more than 100,000 federal public servants are heading off the job and onto the picket line. The Public Service Alliance of Canada will be on strike as of 12.01 a.m. We are still here at the table. What this means for the services you rely on and what the government could do next. The Prime Minister faces backlash for his Christmas vacation. How much should he pay in accommodation per night at this luxurious villa? And Galen Weston steps aside from the top job at Loblaw. Galen's still going to be the power behind the throne. This is The National with David Common. Thanks for joining us. Adrian is away. We begin tonight with breaking news. The strike is a go for many federal public servants after a deadline to reach a new contract agreement came and went. We set a deadline for 9 p.m. this evening, and I can tell you that we do not have a tentative agreement. The impacts of this strike will be felt right across the country, and it will be enormous. More than 100,000 public servants off the job affecting everything from tax refunds to immigration appointments. Kate McKenna tracking all the latest developments for us in Ottawa. Kate, some pretty strong words from the union tonight. David, the union made good on its ultimatum. It said that if it didn't reach a deal, then it would strike, and now it's following through. As of 12.01 a.m. Eastern Time, workers are striking. The union is still at the bargaining table, but it says it wants to send a clear message to government. It's ready for a fight. We will remain at the table. We will remain for as long as it takes during the strike. And we will remain on strike until the government addresses our key issues. The main union demand, more money. A more than 13% raise for workers over three years. That's higher than Ottawa had planned. Its message that the deal should be fair to workers and taxpayers. The union also wants clear rules around remote work. With the sides still divided as the strike deadline approached, preparations and negotiations happened in tandem. We have a competitive and fair wage offer on the table. A strike means the work of government grinds to a crawl. Canadians were warned to expect delays processing taxes, passports and immigration applications, also crossing borders by air or ground. There would be a, a serious impact on any departments that have staff who have been impacted. Uh, we know that uh, processing delays are the kind of thing that, that could take place. Along with wins for its workers, the Public Service Alliance of Canada has been clear. Its goal is a deal that sets a precedent. It's time for wor workers in this country to stand up and stand with us and say enough is enough and push back. All right, Kate, it's been a generation since we've seen a strike of this scale, and we are now hearing from people tonight worried about how it will impact them. For instance, pension payments. Mm. Yes, the whole government is not necessarily shutting down. People will still be able to access uh, essential services like getting their pensions, getting employment insurance. The big question is what comes next? Now, the government says that it has uh, issued a, a fair offer. Uh, it's uh, saying that what PSAC is asking for is unaffordable to Canadians. Uh, now, this can end in one of two ways. Either the two sides can negotiate an agreement uh, and settle on it, or the government can uh, legislate them back to work. So we'll be tracking this story and we'll be seeing how it evolves over the next few hours. Indeed we will. Kate McKenna, thank you very much. Meanwhile, the union representing WestJet pilots says they are poised to strike as early as May 16th, just as the summer travel season kicks off. The Airline Pilots Association says its WestJet members voted overwhelmingly in favor of striking if a contract deal is not reached in time. Their main concerns, wages, scheduling and job protection, both sides still negotiating. One of the most significant media trials in modern U.S. history is no more, and it's costing Fox News a lot of money. It settled with Dominion Voting Systems today for nearly... $790 million U.S. Katie Simpson takes us through the last second settlement. It takes a lot of lawyers to fight a case this significant. The unusually large legal teams arrived appearing very ready for what was being called the American Media Defamation Trial of the Century. 
a fight over whether Fox News knowingly broadcast lies about electronic voting machines made by Dominion Voting Services, a company with Canadian roots. The machine ran an algorithm that shaved votes from Trump and awarded them to Biden. The judge welcomed 12 jurors to his courtroom, setting opening arguments for after lunch. But without explanation, neither judge nor jurors returned. For two and a half hours, bored lawyers chatted and looked at their phones. When the judge finally reappeared, he announced the parties had reached a settlement, sending gasps through the room. While Fox News lawyers left without saying a word, the Dominion team could hardly wait to declare this a victory for the truth. Today's settlement of $787,500,000 represents vindication and accountability. Fox has admitted to telling lies about Dominion that caused enormous damage to my company, our employees and the customers that we serve. Fox News released a statement saying, we acknowledge the court's rulings finding certain claims about Dominion to be false. This settlement reflects Fox's continued commitment to the highest journalistic standards. On the network itself, the court case was barely discussed, and reports suggest it will not have to make any further apology. Evidence showed its star hosts and executives privately mocked and questioned the election fraud claims they broadcast on their network. Despite this, it remains the top-rated U.S. cable news network. I haven't seen much evidence at all that Fox News has reformed itself in the aftermath of all these revelations. Perhaps it will. And hey Katie, this isn't the end of Dominion's legal battles. No, Dominion is going after a couple of smaller right-wing broadcasters which aired similar lies about their voting machines. It's part of a larger effort in the United States right now to really demonstrate that peddling misinformation is not a successful business model. Look what happened last summer to Alex Jones, the conspiracy theorist who spread lies about the families and victims of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting back in 2012. He was ordered to pay more than a billion dollars in damages. The court cases can take a long time to make it through the legal system, but that pushback is, is starting. David. All right, Katie Simpson, thank you. Well, that's the scene in New York City tonight where a parking garage has partially collapsed in Manhattan's financial district. Police confirm one person has been killed, at least five others injured, and work is still being done to ensure there aren't people trapped inside any of those vehicles. The Prime Minister is once again coming under fire for a family vacation. This one taken at a luxurious Jamaican estate as many Canadians were struggling with rising costs. Catherine Cullen takes us through the details first revealed by our colleagues at Radio Canada, as well as the reaction tonight. Canada's Prime, Minist Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is scheduled to vacation in Jamaica after the Christmas holidays. The trip wasn't a secret, but newly revealed details about where the Trudeau stayed, who owns it, and how much it costs taxpayers are anything but relaxing for the Prime Minister. Why won't he answer? How much should he pay in accommodation per night at this luxurious villa? I guess, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition struggles with the concept of friendship. Longtime Trudeau family friend Peter Green owns this Jamaican estate with villas that rent for up to $9,000 per night. No word on whether the PM paid for accommodations, but Canadian taxpayers paid at least $162,000 for security and travel. We worked, as we do, uh, with all vacations with the Ethics Commissioner to make sure uh, that all the rules are followed. Now, Radio Canada has revealed the Green family also made a major donation to the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. The Prime Minister says he hasn't been involved there since 2014. But political opponents say the whole affair reflects a bigger issue. I think that what this vacation shows is just another example of a Prime Minister that doesn't understand the realities of everyday Canadians doesn't, hasn't lived those struggles. Mr. Speaker, this Prime Minister is out of touch and Canadians are out of money. Vacations have been a problem for Trudeau. His family trip to the Aga Khan's private island did violate ethics rules. He was also criticized for going to Tofino on the first national day for truth and reconciliation. This observer says this latest incident suggests either Trudeau isn't learning his lessons or doesn't care about the consequences. So legally there is nothing 
wrong with that. But at the same time, what is the message that you say to all Canadians? Some liberal sources who spoke to Radio Canada question why the Prime Minister keeps taking trips like this, giving his opponents ammunition to attack. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. At a time when Canadian grocery store CEOs are facing accusations of price gouging, the face of Canada's largest supermarket chain is stepping aside from a key role. Misha Patel now with the big change at Loblaw and what it means for shoppers. PC Gourmet Coffee. If you the face of the, the bag, president's we'll choice brand is president no more. Bag, Galen bag, Weston bag, is bag, out of bag, the top bag, job bag, at Loblaw, bag, though he says he's still in charge. Um, you know, I, I'm not leaving. I'm, I'm stepping back into you know, what I consider to be my natural role as the controlling shareholder. Loblaw says the leadership change has been in the works for months. Weston will stay on as chair of the board and CEO of parent company George Weston Limited. He's handing the reins at Loblaw to European retail executive Pear Bank, who most recently has been running the largest supermarket chain in Denmark. This as all major Canadian grocers have been accused of profiting off inflation, even facing parliamentary hearings. Loblaw and Weston have attracted the most public frustration. People working high up at Loblaws are greedy. Galen Weston is a billionaire. While most billionaires don't know what the price of bread and eggs are, Galen Weston definitely does because he's overcharging us for them. I know food prices are top of mind these days. And when Loblaw raised Weston's pay by more than a million dollars a few weeks ago, the move made headlines across the country. The reality is that people are... Um, just feeling a little bit tired of hearing the value message coming from Galen when he doesn't feel relatable. Hundreds of new items. Like Loblaw wouldn't confirm if Weston will still show up like in ads, but this expert says staying out of the spotlight makes sense. We should keep in mind this is a family-owned business and Galen's still going to be the power behind the throne. Though he points out the change in the corner office will make little difference at the checkout. It doesn't help consumers when it comes to their pocketbooks and the high price of groceries. Experts say the five big grocery stores control 80% of the market in Canada. Some suggest relief from soaring food prices will only come with greater competition. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. While grocery prices remain stubbornly high, Canada's inflation rate slowed to 4.3% in March. That's down nearly one percentage point from the previous month and the lowest it's been since August 2021. I mean, things are trending in the right direction, but prices are still increasing. And as Peter Armstrong explains, that's expected to continue. As the cost of food surged this year, Prices here remained pretty steady. We sell cinnamon in bulk. It's $1.95 for 100 grams. This food co-op in Halifax compared their prices to the grocery chains. Organic cinnamon at Superstore was $14.26 per 100 grams. So you're looking at more than seven times the price um, for an identical product. How? Why? The answer is pretty simple. We don't make any profit. We charge a small markup over wholesale prices. Today's CPI numbers show price growth for everything is slowing. Much of that is driven by the falling cost of gasoline. By the summer, the Bank of Canada now expects year-over-year -year inflation to fall to 3% and get all the way back to 2% by next year. But don't mistake that progress in the fight to rein in inflation for prices actually falling. Food costs went up 10.6% in February. They only grew by 9.7% in March. Even if that rate fell to the 2% target, that still means prices are climbing just at a more manageable level. And weathering those higher prices will get more difficult as economists expect the economy to slow in the coming months. Higher interest rates are squeezing households renewing their mortgages. A lot of uncertainties currently because we are sort of at this turning point, this peak of the current economic cycle, so, so to speak, where, um, you know, a lot more weakness can be expected moving forward. We're headed into a tricky time. For months now, jobs and GDP have been surprisingly resilient, but that resiliency is about to be tested as prices continue to rise and interest rates continue to bite, all while the economy is expected to slow to a crawl. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Nova Scotians are marking three years since the mass shooting there. 
carried out by a man impersonating a Mountie. Flags are lowered to half-mast and will remain that way until tomorrow night. People are also being asked to pause at noon to remember and honour those most affected. 22 people were killed on April the 18th and 19th back in 2020. Last month, an inquiry into what happened found the police response severely lacking and recommended a major overhaul to the RCMP. New charges tonight for an 84-year-old white man accused of shooting a black teenager twice after he rang the doorbell. Here's Paul Hunter with what happened and the reaction. We love you, Ralph. We love you, Ralph. After yet another seemingly senseless shooting, yet again seemingly centered on race, in Kansas City, Missouri, they marched. We love you, Ralph. We love you, Ralph, they chanted. Ralph Yarl, the 16-year-old shot last Thursday, now recovering from his wounds and a story that has brought outrage for all who hear it. It was about 9.45. I was like, Ralph, can you please pick up your brothers for me? Being the kiddies, he is. He said, OK. Says but Jarl's mom, her son, way. got mixed up. He went to the wrong address, this place, and rang the doorbell. Then came gunshots, fired straight through the glass door, hitting Jarl twice. Ralph was shot on top of his left eye, and then he was shot again in the upper right arm. 84-year-old Andrew Lester, who's now out on bail, could face life in prison. Lester told police he heard the doorbell, thought it was a break-in, and when he saw the teenager on his doorstep, he felt, quote, scared for his life. Missouri is one of some 30 U.S. states where if you fear your life is threatened, you can respond with deadly force. Blackness is not a threat. Lee Merritt, lawyer for Ralph Yarl's family, underlines a familiar key aspect here is racial bias. Just being black has been seen as a threat often in this country. And so when we hear him say, I fear it for my life, and we know that the only thing he was being confronted with was a 16-year-old ringing his doorbell, it is uh, obviously unjustifiable uh, for him to decide to use deadly force against this so-called threat. And so they demonstrate, supporting Ralph Yarl, perplexed, frustrated, enraged in this country yet again. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. In northern Minnesota, police say nine people have been detained trying to illegally cross from Canada into the U.S. Authorities say it was the group themselves that called 911 looking for help and that they were found in very cold water with their pants frozen to their bodies. A number of the detainees were treated for hypothermia. Two Canadian women and three teenage girls who went missing in northern Syria for 11 days have now been located. Their lawyer says they were following instructions from the Canadian government in order to get to a plane that would fly them to this country. Ashley Burke takes us through what we know about what went wrong. For two Canadian women and three teenage girls held captive at this camp in northeastern Syria, a repatriation flight organized by Canada was supposed to be their way out of danger. But their lawyer says the plan put them in harm's way. The government bears some responsibility here. He says the government told the women they had to make their way from the Owl Hole detention camp to another camp for ISIS suspects and their family members hours away and to ask Kurdish authorities to take them there. They expressed concern to the government because the guards at this Kurdish camp are violent, could be aggressive, may imprison them, may harm them. They were told by the government that they had been given assurances that they would be transported and that they would be repatriated. But that didn't happen. Instead, the women went missing for 11 days, until now. Their lawyer says one of the women made a short proof of life call to a relative and alleged they had been detained at prisons and mistreated by Kurdish guards. I'm devastated. I, 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 like their families, find it sickening. The lawyer says a Global Affairs Canada official called a relative a week ago while searching for the women. In an audio recording of the call, that official is heard saying repatriations gone wrong have happened to other countries and they tried to warn us. And when it did actually happen, we were kind of shocked by it. It is stunning uh, to hear any government official suggest that they didn't think that a human rights risk of this nature was a very real possibility in northeast Syria. 
Now, Ashley, you listened to that audio. What else did you hear? Well, the Global Affairs Canada official was heard saying that they were devastated the woman didn't make it to the pickup point to get on that plane and that the government was continuing to exhaust every avenue to try and find them. The government confirmed to lawyers it's now located the five Canadians at that camp they were supposed to be repatriated from. But there's no word yet on when the women could be brought back to Canada. All right, Ashley, thanks very much. An American journalist is back in a Russian prison tonight, facing the prospect of two decades behind bars. The charges against Evan are baseless. Today's court appearance and the difficult road ahead for Evan Gershkovich. That's next. Some of Canada's biggest tourist attractions are facing major challenges as they gear up for a busy summer season. People who were habitually part of the workforce seem to have vanished. What you need to know if you're planning a trip. And a strange and beautiful sight in the sky. Am I seeing, am I actually seeing this? Like, am we going to get beamed up to another galaxy or something? What was behind this mysterious spiral of light? We're back in two. Two explosions caught on live television as a proposed ceasefire failed to take hold in Sudan. The UN says at least 185 people have been killed since fighting broke out Saturday. This is between government forces and a paramilitary group. The continued fighting leaves many in Khartoum desperate for basic supplies like food and water. U.S. journalist Evan Gershkovich is back in a Moscow prison tonight. A judge upheld his detention today ahead of a criminal trial on espionage charges. Briar Stewart shows us what appears to be a crackdown on accountability. Evan Gershkovich smiled at the reporters briefly led into his hearing. The red marks from handcuffs still visible on his wrists. Not surprisingly, his appeal for bail was rejected by the court, but his legal team and the U.S. government say they will keep fighting. The charges against Evan are baseless, and we call on the Russian Federation to immediately release him. The Wall Street Journal reporter is facing two decades in prison after being charged with espionage. Gershkovich moved to Moscow in 2017, four decades after his parents left the Soviet Union for the United States. I know that he felt like it was his duty to report, and uh, he loved Russian people, you know. He still does. Journalists have become an enemy of the Kremlin. Many independent Russian journalists have long since fled or been imprisoned. I, I had a terrible flashbacks, because I saw some photos of uh, Evan. It was very heartbreaking. Ksenia Miranova's partner, former journalist Ivan Safranov, was convicted of treason in 2022. Gershkovich covered his case and Miranova got to know him and they became friends. And I even told him uh, that I think that all the foreign journalists, uh, they are not, they, they could not be safe in Russia. She says there's hope Gershkovich, as a U.S. citizen, could be swapped in a prisoner exchange. But there's no guarantee. For now, Gershkovich's lawyers say his spirits are high. He, he uh, told us that maybe he will write uh, some, some uh, good uh, novel at the end about of the himself. story. About himself. <laughs> The U.S. ambassador has been able to visit Gershkovich once in prison where he'll remain until at least the end of May. Meanwhile, the ambassadors from the U.S., the U.K. and Canada were summoned to Russia's foreign ministry where they were rebuked for criticizing the country's crackdown on activists and journalists. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. More than a century after it was taken from their community, a B.C. First Nation is relishing the return of a sacred totem pole. What comes with that pole is, is going to be healing spirits. Why it's so much more than just a piece of their history. Next. A controversial term used to explain deaths in police custody. If you say it's excited delirium, it's basically the fault of the person who died. The shift in thinking many say is long overdue. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world next.
A cultural treasure is back where it belongs after more than a century. The totem pole was taken from Nuhok territory in BC and ended up in a museum until hereditary leaders said enough was enough. We first showed you the day of victory back in February when the totem pole was lifted to freedom. Tonight, we show you its remarkable journey back to the land of its creation. Wamish Hamilton captured the profound emotions as people reclaimed their spiritual heritage. When I was young, there was hardly any, any curvers here. It was taken away from us. You feel nervous in ways, but uh, I guess a sign of relief. You know, one of the, the masterpieces coming home and staying home where it belongs. On February the 13th, there was a large number of uh, New Halt people and onlookers who were gathered outside the Provincial Museum in Victoria. To witness the, the beginnings of the repatriation of the pole that had belonged to the New Halt people, to the New Halt people themselves. When the pole made its first appearance, when it was winched out of the window, when I thought about it, that was the first breath of fresh air, the first rays of daylight that it had felt in over a century. It comes from a long, long time ago, you know, and it's built with uh, hands that, that had no, they had no um, damage to it, you know, and it was created with love and you know, and I think what comes with that pole is, is going to be healing spirits. You know, and it's something that we need, not only in our nation, but all nations. Yeah. Well, the emotions are kicking in. I could feel that spirit. And uh, it's, it's starting to kick in. And uh, I just don't know how to put it right now, but. My grandfather going home. The pole was carved by the ancestor of Chief Derek Snow of the New Hulk. And it was carved in the 1880s. And when you think about it, that pole was carved before colonization. And the man who carved it was also born before colonization. He was born in a time when there was no English and there was no non-Indigenous people around yet, or there were very few. The thinking, the craft itself, the worldview would have been all New Hulk, just New Hulk. It's a type of pole called a stream. That's in their, their New Hawk language, a stream. And a stream is a grave marker. It's something that had marked the grave of one of, one of Chief Snow's ancestors when it was taken. For something like that to be stolen within the context of New Hawk culture, New Hawk people would have per perceived that as a, a big taboo, a big cultural no-no. My sense of it is if, you know, a New Hawk person especially, but if any other Indigenous person walked in a museum and saw their ancient pole, you know, it's like seeing a, 
something so proud, caged, jailed, incarcerated, imprisoned. Every item that they have in the, in the museums, uh, they have a purpose. And their purpose was for our people. So we understand who we are as a people. And most of us have lost that, like our language, our songs, and our dances. During my time wasn't very nice, but uh, we weren't even allowed to uh, speak our language or do these carvings, but it was, it was kept secret, right? So, but uh, it's making a big comeback now, and uh, we're not going to lose it. By bringing back uh, my great-grandfather's totem pole, it means a lot to us. It left the museum, it was blessed, they wrapped it again and uh, got it ready for transport from Victoria all the way back to its home in New Hawk Lands in Bella Coola. in your heart knowing that that it was it was here it was finally home it arrived and it, it's, it's here now I wanted to dance celebrate yell the joy of like knowing that yeah he's he's home today is just giving me a lot of hope and a lot of sorry, a lot of love in my heart to be able to witness this and witness my family do something so historic, something that a lot of First Nations people are trying to do, trying to bring back, trying to bring back our, our culture. To me, we were second people for so long and seeing it's, we're coming out of it. Uh, the young children will, will see it, you know, and understand what it's all about. I'm happy that we can put the totem pole right here in this, in this school. Our family had decided that um, for a big purpose, um, this is where the children are. And this is the, um, this is the prime place that they will be able to see it and history can be carried on for tomorrow. The plan is, uh, I understand, for it to sit at the school for a year and then it's gonna be moved to the, their old village site and it will be left to the elements to die a natural death. I understand the pole is not being treated with anything, that it's gonna remain in its natural state. Yes. Even when it's out of the elements. Yes. Is that a tradition? Yes. And it returns back to its natural state. In a very large sense, you know, what they've done is they've brought it home to die. Until that time, and during the year before, you can bet the new Hulk will fill its life, what's left of its life, with life. And it's not gonna be a sad thing when it's gone. It'll be with all of its other ancestor carvings that are gone now. And of course, with the man who made it. Well, Mish Hamilton told us about another important artifact that's being returned. This one from overseas. The National Museum of Scotland announced late last year that it's giving a looted totem pole back to the Niska Nation in BC about 110 years after a Canadian anthropologist removed it. As an inquest looks into the death of a BC man beaten by police, the term excited delirium is getting more attention. 
I wholeheartedly welcome the shift. I, I think it's the, the right thing. Coming up, we'll take a closer look at what the term means and why many forensic pathologists are moving away from it. A coroner's inquest into the death of Miles Gray continues in B.C. The 33-year-old unarmed man died after an altercation with Vancouver police nearly nine years ago. Today, his family heard an audio recording from that day of police calling for an ambulance after Gray was beaten. When we heard that audio, it spoke nothing that he was being tortured and he was in agony, like he was screaming. A Vancouver police officer also testified at the inquest, the first member of the force to speak publicly about the case in more than seven years. The purpose of the inquest is to determine the facts around Gray's death. That includes what caused it. A forensic pathologist has said he's unable to rule out something called excited delirium. It's a term that's being used to explain deaths of people in encounters with police. Christine Birak explains what exactly the term means and why experts are shifting away from it. Excited delirium has been used to explain why hundreds of people have died in police custody. These videos are difficult to watch. From the knee on George Floyd's neck to the death of Abdi Rahman Abdi in Ottawa and Robert Jakansky at the Vancouver airport. Doctors have argued the term excited delirium is unscientific and used to protect police officers from being held accountable. Now, after decades of debate, many American and Canadian medical examiners and coroners say they're shifting away from using excited delirium as a cause of death. If you say it's excited delirium, it's basically the fault of the person who died. Dr. Michael Freeman teaches forensic medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. He says excited delirium is often used to describe a state of aggression and distress, generally linked to drug use or mental illness. Freeman co-authored a review examining the role of restraint in fatal excited delirium cases. The review found no evidence to support excited delirium as a cause of death in the absence of restraint, noting asphyxia must be considered a likely cause of death. The more aggressive the restraint, the more likely they were to die. Well, that's pretty good scientific evidence that it's the restraint that's the killer. I wholeheartedly welcome the shift. I, I think it's the, the right thing. Psychiatrists have long dismissed excited delirium as a medical diagnosis. It is a description of pre-hospital behavior that does not explain someone's death, in my view. So, Christine, you talk about this shift that's happening. Where do coroners across the country stand on excited delirium? We reached out to all the provinces and coroners in BC, Alberta, Manitoba and Newfoundland all told CBC News they no longer recognize excited delirium as a cause of death. Only New Brunswick would say it still does. But here's the thing, whether the medical community recognizes excited delirium or not, police forces can say they believe it's a factor. The doctors we spoke with say they don't think that's helpful. They understand policing is a dangerous and difficult job, but they're really hoping that police forces will make more changes to officer training and procedures and protocols for restraint and dealing with people in distress. All right, Christine, thank you. You're welcome. Coming up, tourist spots are expecting pre-pandemic levels this summer. Why some say they won't be able to meet the demand of all those travelers. Plus, what is happening? Is this a UFO? A mysterious glimmering cyclone gives these travelers a light show that's out of this world in our moment. I'm here to announce that I plan on making a comeback to the NFL. That is Damar Hamlin. The Buffalo Bills safety has now been cleared to play just months after suffering a cardiac arrest during a game. It happened on this play. The team says three specialists gave him the green light to resume full activity. Hamlin says what happened was life-changing, but adds it is not the end of his story. With summer just around the corner, some major tourism spots are struggling to find enough workers. Julia Wong takes us to Jasper, Alberta to find out how that shortage could affect your summer plans. 
The small town of Jasper is a gem in the Rocky Mountains, drawing visitors from around the world. A key draw, the Jasper Sky Tram. The trams are leaving on scheduled departure times throughout the day. Todd Noble is ready to welcome back more tourists this summer, but there's a problem. He needs up to 40 staff and only has about half of that. It's frustrating. You've taken the time to recruit, you've taken the time to set up the interview, you've had the interview, and then it, uh, it just all seems to fall apart. What percentage of businesses in Jasper are connected to tourism or hospitality? Realistically, um, 100%. Finding workers here is normally difficult. Housing in the national park is hard to find and expensive. But this year seems more challenging, says the mayor. People who were habitually part of the workforce seem to have vanished. They, they just left and they haven't returned in the same numbers. Can I get a side of fries? Evie Mermingus's family-run restaurant needs at least three more servers and one more cook. She has not taken vacation in three years and works constantly. I'm pretty used to it, but it does take a toll on you for sure. Everyone needs a break, right? This store keeps a we're hiring sign up all the time. Staff turnover is high. What does that mean for how you guys operate? Well, I'm, I'm down here today working a shift. <laughs> Add all that up and the tourist experience could look different this summer. For example, a hotel with a no vacancy sign that doesn't mean that 100% of the rooms are occupied. It means that they have sold all the rooms that they have cleaners to clean. Noble says disruptions are possible, so he has this advice. Book in advance. That would be my recommendation. Plan ahead. Maybe Plan ahead. be patient. And be patient, yes. <laughs> With thousands of tourists expected, that may be necessary if Jasper is not able to attract more workers. But businesses say they'll do their best to accommodate visitors this summer. Julia Wong, CBC News, Jasper, Alberta. No, this is not CGI, it's very real. The dazzling spiral of light blazed across the Arctic night sky this weekend, baffling those who witnessed it. So what was it? An undiscovered galaxy, a UFO? Talia McDonald and Paul Hayes were driving a remote northern highway when the out-of-this-world spectacle had them asking the same questions in our moment. Am I actually seeing this? So we were driving down the Dempster Highway and uh, Talia was just getting some rest and I noticed just a blue swirl cyclone in the sky. I thought it was actually kind of tripping out a little bit. I mean, we're going to get beamed up to another galaxy or something. And so Paul woke me up and... I just sort of like immediately just stood and stared out at this orb in the sky. Um, and we were both like, what is happening? Is this a UFO? Um, what is going on right now? Somebody figured out that about two hours before we saw that there was a this SpaceX launch. And so I, I think what we're seeing is is typically they will do a, a deorbit burn or or and dump their fuel. The rocket was probably spinning when they did that. So you get that sort of swirly effect, sort of like a, a lawn sprinkler. Like it was just magical, absolutely magical, just because like you're surrounded by like the Patagonia of Canada. This out of worldly experience. Yeah, it was, it was pretty special. Okay, so a fuel dump just as it's twisting in the sky and out come these water particles, which then freeze, creating that once in a lifetime experience, we are told really quite something beautiful, but probably a bit spooky when you're out there on an isolated highway. That is the National for April 18th. Have a great night.